So I'll start with an example. So throughout the next 40 minutes, I will be talking about an example, which essentially is employee expense management. Most uh, organization has an employee expense management system delivered by IT in some form or shape. It might be delivered as internally developed or as a service or whatever, it doesn't really matter. In this example, we, um, we basically say, well, you have a conceptual service called employee expense management, EAM, if you abbreviate it, and um, essentially it delivers uh, three kind of business functions. You can register expense, you can manage expense reports, and you can approve expense reports. Um, that particular conceptual service is dependent on other conceptual services. Uh, it uses, uh, it sends notifications and, and, uh, and you actually pay the expense reports. So it interface to financial application and to email service. And also in order to run the service, it relies on a database service and a and general application execution environment, AKA a server, right? Uh, so that's in essence, the, uh, the conceptual service. And the details of it is something you probably have modeled out in an enterprise architecture uh, tool where you uh, took these uh, three functions that uh, the systems is delivering, uh, register, manage, and approve expenses, uh, and put it into the general business flow of the businesses that are managing expenses. So coming from, from the CFO and the finance department working with the business units of how to do that. Of course, this is a simplified view. In practice, there would be more dependencies and more details, but uh, this should be good enough for, for now. Now, uh, what would happen is that demand is raised um, and uh, the demand is uh, about people want a mobile experience. Um, and also, actually, we want to reduce the cost of operating uh, the employee expense management. So can we do something in terms of, of finding a smarter way of, uh, of running it so it doesn't cost us as much? So that demand coming in, some of it from the business, that's the mobile experience, and the other one is from the uh, CFO or CIO saying, well, we need to figure out how to optimize how we run this. So when you capture the demand, you, uh, you start um, working the actual way of of delivering that demand so you you put it into a a uh, proposal that you sign off uh, with an IT project that is going to then actually deliver this and uh, and explaining a little bit about how that goes on uh, we'll come back to how it works financially and and how you actually allocate money and make a decision so that will be at the end when we talk IT financial management. The important part here is that people understand, you all understand that there are kind of these two organizations, the one with the business view that works on the conceptual service, uh, work on the enterprise architecture, that communicate with the business through the demand uh, component in terms of portfolio backlog items. And then you hand it over in terms of a project to a development organization. And in the development organization, you refine the backlog items into dedicated requirements that is being developed. And you design what you want to do in terms of a logical service blueprint associated with the logical service that you're going to deliver. And so if we look at a potential service blueprint for for this that is associated with, uh, that could be one of several blueprints you develop. It could look something like this, that you, uh, that you have an existing design and you add further entities to it in terms of uh, uh, you want to register this bench, you want to be able to do it by uh, create it from a photo so you can, on your mobile app, you can take a picture of your expense and it will be registered. And that would be something delivered by a mobile expense app that needs to run on iOS and Android and uh, and also needs to be dependent on a mobile backend. Uh, and I won't go into the details of how this is worked out, but this is where you actually start working as a software developer and architecting the implementation of that. It's not the business architecture, it's the software architecture you work on when you work in the logical space. And so let's take a little bit of an intermezzo about not how the EEM uh, employee expense management system is being done, but how the service backbone then work, regardless of what kind of a service we are, we are actually working on. 
So I showed the, the concept of uh, the requirements and the design with the logical service. But what happens is that you would um, you would then start planning out releases of this service. So you have the project, you need to have the next release of the uh, expense management system. And there you would keep track on the bills you're doing, so they will be associated with the uh, with the release. The uh, the requirements you have associated with the, with the uh, service release, uh, and also the defect that a particular release is or built is happening. And this is where we explain the difference, or one of the things that can explain the difference between a service release and a service release blueprint. That is not typically well understood by most people initially reading IT for IT. But what you would have is that um, first you have a, um, uh, a planned release. So the development team say, well, in April, we're gonna release version 2.0. But as you approach uh, April, you will actually start building something that could be worked. So it would be build number one, build number two, build number three. And each of them will have a certain set of defects associated as you test it out. So you keep track on what defects are associated with a particular build, not with a particular release, but the build of that release. And eventually, you will then take a particular build, which you would call a service release, associated with a service release blueprint, and that is the one you can release and give over to the fulfillment executions as a blueprint for um, instantiating and also giving to the service catalog entry so that you can actually know what you can consume. And so a little bit then on the notion of subscription because it uh, becomes very important uh, when we talk about IT financial management and also how the service model moves from a service blueprint into a desired and actual service model. So first off, in order for a subscription to be created, there needs to be an offer. The offer is what commercially define what you can consume from the service catalog. So it puts a price tag and a service quality and various other things on top of the, the technical entity, which is called the catalog entry or service catalog entry. And when you create a subscription, you also, create a chargeback contract. So basically you associate with the subscription a chargeback contract. It comes from the offer saying, well, this is how you are being offered the subscription. This is how I want to be charged for that particular subscription. And it's actually also where you would create the service level agreement. So the monitoring of how you want from a business perspective to monitor that subscription, but that's outside of the realm of this presentation. And then for each period, each charging period, there will be a chargeback record being generated. So if you run a monthly uh, billing cycle or quarterly billing cycle, that doesn't really matter. But for each of these cycles, you will create one chargeback record associated with that contract. So in April, there will be chargeback. In May, there will be chargeback. In, in June, there will be chargeback. It will all use the same a uh, chargeback contract that describes how to compute the chargeback um, and it would compute it. And it, the input to computing that chargeback will be based on all the usage information. And there can be many usage records being collected that are associated with a single chargeback record if it's a complicated service. We'll come back to that in, in more detail there. There can also be zero if you just say it's a flat price you're paying every period. You don't really measure usage, you just say it always costs $5 a month to have an employee expense management seat. The way you collect the uses record is actually based on uh, what is in the desired service model. So we'll come back to the desired service model in a slide or two from now, but essentially as you, as you instantiate uh, an a, um, employee expense management system, you also figure out what is the structure of that and then you know what it is you can go and measure in order to figure out what is the uses of the employee expense management. And 
if we go on from there, then essentially what is happening is that it's kind of a two uh, step in R2F is that the service blueprint, the service release blueprint has been registered as a catalog entry and the fulfillment execution knows about it uh, as, a, as a template. And then going up through the consumption and down as a subscription, uh, you say, I want an instance of this. So let's think about it when we talk about employee expense management. Really what could happen is that um, I've developed a new employee expense management and I want to run it in one region of the world. I'm a big international company and I want to run it in, say, Europe. And, uh, and so as a service owner, I can then say, I want to create a subscription to that kind of service and get an instance created in EMEA. And then the fulfillment execution will stand up all the servers, all the databases, all the connectivity that is needed in order to instantiate an employee expense management system in EMEA. And as it does that, it starts by computing a desired service. What should it look like? What do I need? And then it goes on and allocates it from asset management. It calls the various fulfillment engines that can configure and stand up the needed services. And as it does that, it populates the actual service model so that you can start monitoring it. And at the same time, you actually also set up all the monitoring and, and all the collection that you need in order to maintain and manage and, and uh, track the service when it's uh, running. This is different than a lot of organizations, how they do it today, because very often it's just a release from development directly into production. So the old paradigm of plan, build, run with the R2F is replaced by plan, build, consume, run. And that helps a lot in terms of doing IT financial management. So that's another reason why we have that extra step in IT pricing. So let's go back to the uh, employee expense management scenario. So essentially what we have here is that the logical service model is that uh, we are developing a, an employee expense management component of some sort with code and tests we can do associated. And then we define a release. In April, we're going to release it. Um, and the release defines not only the software itself, but also all the things around the software. So what are the requirements to the, uh, to the operating environments, uh, uh, maybe even to the point of uh, uh, people that needs to be allocated in support in order to run the service, etc. And all of that is wrapped up into a release package, which is something we have at level, level two in the IT for IT, which consists of the service release blueprint, plus the build package that is part of that particular release, plus the installed recipes, plus a compilation of all known errors, etc. And that package is the package that you will uh, deliver to the fulfillment execution so that it can actually uh, do the instantiation and configuration and, and deployment of an instance of uh, employee expense management. And the service release blueprint itself is the one that maintains the topology, the service model of the release, which might say for employee expense management version 1 build 47, that it contains a software build 324 plus the requirements to a hosting platform, plus requirements to some uh, uh, people that need to maintain it, plus the requirements on a backup service that needs to be running when the software is running. Of course, that model can be much more complicated. That's a simplified model we have in this example. And so once it's been uh, uh, pushed to R2F, you, have the, uh, the, you can create the offer, uh, which would define the policy and contract that can be used to uh, deploy such a system. And let's then imagine that that Hans is going to be the owner in EMEA, in Europe, uh, for an instance of employee expense management. So he consumes it and you create a subscription uh, of the, uh, the functional component will maintain an instance of the subscription that register that Hans is the owner of this uh, service. Uh, it's located in EMEA. And maybe the policy has been defined so that you uh, can define what kind of deployment type you want. It could be the pro uh, production or it could be a test deployment or um, pre-production or various other kinds of deployment types. And uh, 
it has a reference back to the actual catalog entry. Uh, it will have a reference down to the desired service model that the fulfillment engine will create so that we have traceability between subscription and the underpinning desired service model. And the desired service model is where we will translate the, uh, the general uh, deployment type, the policy, deployment policy at the uh, offer subscription layer called production into, okay, it means that it needs to be eight times four quality, the data security needs to be private because it's real data, it's not test data. Um, and, and also because the deployment we, uh, in production, we will allocate uh, the STEs uh, that is needed, the, uh, the people that is needed to maintain it. And so from there, we, um, we go and look into the desired service model and the desired service model reflects the service release model uh, in terms of the software, it's hosting, it's uh, FTs and it's backup. But now it's being instantiated with the requirement that, for instance, the hosting uh, is going to be on a particular IP uh, with uh, stories on a particular LUN, maybe, um, that the FTs are allocated at, at um, essentially uh, with contact information uh, so that we know that this is the mail address to get uh, uh, two people to be assigned to actually do support uh, and there's a particular instance of the backup service. And as after this has been allocated, then the fulfillment execution engine will go and actually then configure all of these things. Um, and uh, in addition to configuring them, uh, getting populated the actual service uh, model, which will very much look like the desired service model, except it might have further details on it, like the serial number of the hardware, if there is hardware. We don't really care of it as a desired thing, but there is an actual thing around it. Um, and then uh, the, uh, you might also, or it will set up monitoring uh, in, in terms of, of making sure that, that uh, you collect uses and you, and you collect uh, uh, status information, is it running or not running? Uh, it might also test whether it's working before it finally signs it up as now it's up and running and then it will feed that information back to the subscription module so that you know that now your uh, employee expense management is running in, in the end. And so if we look at it from a picture perspective, what is really happening here is that um, essentially this circle I have uh, is and here I represent it as an actual service. Uh, it could also be the desired service. They are one-to-one -to, -one to each other, right? Uh, that uh, a service owner hands has a service contract uh, on the delivery of, an, of a service, which consists of some software and, and a hosting service and a backup service. Uh, and if we look at that in more detail, that actually references the hosting and the backup services to seats on a hosting service, for instance. So there might be another person in EMEA that owns and runs a hosting service, either internally or externally. It could be Amazon or it could be internally in your own department. Right. And uh, and that one you get a seat on, uh, which, and, and the seat is represented as having some degree of network, some particular OS instance and some compute that is essentially a virtual machine on a, on a Hyper-V. Uh, and so Peter, that is the owner here on the on the hosting service, has uh, probably automated a way of you to allocate such a seed, a hosting seed. Uh, and as part of allocating you, in addition to just getting the virtual machine, you also, for instance, in an asset management system, allocate an operating system license. Um, and precisely the same is what you will be doing on the backup service. You get a seed on the backup server. Uh, and and uh, with all the right policies, which would imply that on a regular basis, uh, your your employee expense management data will get backed up to a backup service somewhere. And once you have that in place, you can start consuming employee expense management. So all the users in EMEA can all get a seat on that uh, employee expense management. And you can model that out as well. Now, you might not in many IT organizations actually model all of these seats because it's, you have uh, 10,000 people in EMEA and, uh, and you don't want to have a little service model in your CMDB for that. 
uh, but you could in practice and, and actually you often do it, but you don't do it in the seem to be, you do it in some other systems, you, you manage that information so you actually know who has subscribed or who is using the employee expense manager. And the owner in EMEA might not be the same one that overall is responsible for employee expense management in Americas, uh, in US. Uh, and that could be another person, so they each have their own instance of this system, uh, but it's a single software development. It could also be two different versions of the EEM that they're running in Americas and in media. And now we can manage all of that. So let's take a deep breath and say, okay, now I went all the way from uh, conceptually outlining that we have an employee expense management system, we have new requirements to it, we develop those, we release them, we put them into request to fulfill, you instantiate a desired service model and thereby also an actual service model. And and uh, so, so that's the entire way left to write. And secondly, what I also showed is that in terms of service modeling, what I teach for IT support is a hierarchical uh, service models so that the employee expense management system is dependent on seats on a hosting service and seats on a backup service. And you have a service hierarchy uh, among those. These things are very important because that supports that you can actually uh, do cost management. You can, you can divide and conquer responsibility throughout the IT organization. And you can actually also do that across organizational boundaries. 